Thank you for the introduction. As Tara said, I'm going to try to keep it really brief because uh, I know a lot of people have already talked about rain gardens today, and hopefully some of you already know about them. I know there's a lot of master naturalists and master gardeners in the crowd today. Uh, so I hope everyone's enjoying their lunch. To start with, a rain garden is a bowl-shaped depression designed to capture, hold, and absorb rainwater. So from the surface level, they often look like uh, maybe just lowered garden beds. You're going to see a lot of native and adapted plants in them. But when you look at a cross section and you're actually looking below ground, they will often have layers of different types of soil and substrate material that help with infiltration and filtration. So if you're doing your rain garden, maybe just in a residential area, in your backyard or in your regular garden, you'll be mostly focused on infiltration. So you're gonna have your layers of loose native soil, you're gonna have a little maybe compost that you've added, and you're gonna have layers of mulch and maybe even rocks or gravel along the edge. And that's just designed so that you can try to infiltrate that water, uh, any water that flows into it, it's gonna soak down to the ground, it's gonna be absorbed by those plants, and you'll be capturing any water that might be running off in other directions. If you have a larger uh, rain garden, maybe if you have one outside of the parking lot, or if you have one at a larger building, kind of like some of ours, then you might even have a drainage pipe going through. As you can see in that diagram right there, we have an outflow pipe. So this is more of a filtration system. So as that water flows through the layers of soil that are there, uh, maybe throws through, flows through some uh, fabrics, some gravels, maybe types of sands, and that's gonna filter that water. And eventually when the water gets to the drainage pipe, it's gonna be very clean water that we can then move on. And when you're looking for uh, building a rain garden, one of the largest things that you're gonna think of is what type of plants you're gonna put in it. So obviously we're always gonna suggest native uh, plants. If you have to, maybe some adapted plants, but native is usually the best way to go. And you're going to want a plant that's able to survive uh, periods of a lot of water. So uh, maybe 24 to 48 hours where they might be inundated with water as it either filters or infiltrates into the soil. And you're also going to want a plant that can survive long periods of drought. So especially here in the Hill Country, you know we've been in a drought for about a year and a half now. So the rain gardens don't have much rain in them. They don't have a lot of water in them. But luckily, many of our native plants are really used to those cycles of floods and droughts. Um, because that's just what happened here in the Hill Country. So some plants you might look for are uh, switchgrass, mealy blue sage, eastern gamma grass, um, even some beautyberry or some other bushes. But rain gardens offer lots of benefits to the environment and to people. And one of their largest environmental impacts is their ability to filter water and to take out pollutants. So when it rains in urban areas, a lot of that precipitation ends up flowing off of the area it falls. It's not able to soak into the ground. So we look at this photo here, you can see that there is a lot of impervious cover. So there's a lot of buildings, there's a lot of asphalt parking lots, there's a lot of sidewalks. So that means when it rains, that precipitation, instead of being able to soak into the ground, is gonna flow off and it's gonna pick up any pollutants that are there on the ground. And then you see uh, in some areas like this, which is an undeveloped kind of ranch land area, there's a lot of vegetation here, uh, there's not much impervious cover. So that means when it rains, it's going to be a lot easier for that rain to actually soak in. It's going to be grabbed by the vegetation, it's going to be grabbed by the soil, and it's not going to run off as much. Or it's more likely to be caught by vegetation while it runs off. And these are some of the different types of pollutants that runoff can pick up. Uh, so obviously you have here in the top left sediment. So when that water is flowing across those impervious surfaces, picks up sediment, that is actually poor pollution. It's not something we typically think of because it's not a typical pollutant. Uh, but when it picks up that sedimentation, it will go into the water and it can change the habitat for the fish, make it more difficult for them to survive. Uh, it can decrease the oxygen levels in the water, which is also bad for any aquatic life. We have fecal bacteria from um, often people's yards or dog parts if people are not picking up after themselves or even just waterfowl uh, animals that are supposed to live there. When that fecal bacteria is picked up, then it gets carried to the water and that can raise bacteria levels of the water potentially to unsafe levels for swimmers and recreators. And then nutrients is a big thing. So when people are over fertilizing their yard, often not on purpose, it's usually with good intentions. They want their plants to grow. They want their yards to look really nice. When you over fertilize, you're introducing a lot of nutrients to the system and your vegetation can't always soak them all in. Sometimes they'll just sit on the top. And when you have that runoff go across, 
All that water is going to pick up those nutrients. It's going to take them to the local water body, and then it's going to potentially cause algal blooms or other types of problems. And then our most obvious one is you know, hazardous and toxic chemicals. Uh, if there's maybe a spill in a parking lot, or often if someone has a vehicle that's a little bit leaky, um, then all that's going to fall onto the pavement. It's not going to soak in, right? And it's going to be picked up by that runoff and taken to the water. So while I was mostly talking about pollutants from urban areas, all those types of problems can happen in rural areas as well, or even residential areas. Especially a big thing I know is sedimentation in some of the areas around here in Kerrville. You can see it when you drive by after a big rainfall event. There's a lot of soil, there's a lot of gravel in the street, and all that's going to be picked up by the water eventually and going to flow down to the river. We really want to prevent that from happening. We want to be able to capture the precipitation that's falling in the areas that's falling. So rain gardens can really help by that, is they capture that water, they're going to filter it, and they're going to take out some of those pollutants or keep them there in the garden. And especially when you're talking about um, nutrients from over-fertilizing, like I mentioned earlier, the vegetation is actually going to be able to use that. So a big thing when you have a rain garden is that you don't want to fertilize it. It's going to be naturally getting more fertilizers than other uh, plants will be getting. And I know uh, definitely Didi talked about that a lot earlier. Be careful with how much you're fertilizing. A lot of native plants don't need it or need a very minimal amount. And another thing that uh, rain gardens can benefit humans with, this is a more direct way, is they can help prevent localized flooding and erosion. So especially if you have a property or a yard where you're getting a lot of drainage in one spot. You know, we live in the hill country, there's a lot of slopes here. Um, no one's yards are perfectly flat. We're having a lot of runoff even in really small levels. So seeing where that drainage is on your property and being able to follow that and put a rain garden there will help prevent you losing so much of the sediment from your yard that you might be losing to erosion over time. And it'll be able to help a little bit with uh, flooding that can happen in streets, especially in areas where we don't have uh, stormwater drains. I know some streets here in Kerrville don't. And on top of all that, they look really nice, right? <clears throat> so that photo there on the left, I mean, it's a beautiful area right there. You know, it can add greenery to an urban space that doesn't have any, or it can add to an already very lush landscape. And so I talked a lot about rain gardens, but we actually have some in our edgescape that's been mentioned a couple times a day, especially I know Frank talked about our edgescape quite a bit. Uh, we have a couple rain gardens. We, our most traditional and probably largest, easiest to see one, is going to be out here on this side of the building. It's by our large black condensate tank there, and this is the rain garden. Uh, we have a ton of different natives in it. They kind of come and go with the seasons, depending on what the climate's been looking like. Uh, but we often have in there inland sea oaks, which I know has been talked about some today, as well as mealy blue sage and cinizo. And we also have this signage right here that's at our rain garden, as well as a lot of different other spots around our edgescape. And that signage is talking more in depth about the different conservation practices <coughs> we're using. So if you have maybe some free time later this afternoon, or you're visiting for uh, another day, it would be a good opportunity to walk around and see some of the different techniques we encourage for conservation. So, that was a super quick rundown of rain gardens, which can be all different shapes, all different sizes, all different depths, you know, depending on what your property looks like, what your drainage area looks like. There's lots of different resources online that can help you calculate those and determine what rain garden is best for your situation and your property. Uh, we have some of those resources on our website at ugra.org, and we also have a lot of links to other resources as well there. So I encourage you to check out rain gardens if you don't have one, and maybe you're thinking, well, this could be great for this one spot in my yard. Go ahead and do a little bit more research, and there'll be a great way to use nature-based infrastructure. So thank you so much for listening to me during your uh, lunch that you've been waiting for. I appreciate your time and your attention, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the seminar.